Thank you, Shripriya. Good afternoon, everybody. Am I audible, uh, Shripriya? Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so, uh, before moving on to presentation as such, uh, we have a poll. Uh, so, all of you can participate in that. And um, please select the right answers and submit. How many uh, questions do we have, Shripriya? Sir, 13 questions in set of two polls, sir. Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, shall we launch the first uh, poll? Yes, sir. Uh, for the kind information of everyone, those who are not much familiar with the process, we will be launching poll one and poll two, which will be poll one will be having seven questions and poll two will be having six questions. You have to choose one appropriate answer. And once you have completed attempting all the questions in the poll one, you have to submit it. So uh, we will be having some time to submit the answers, but uh, we once again remind that there are no right or wrong answers in it. Choose the most appropriate answer, which you feel is the most appropriate. Launching the poll one. So we can take three minutes and after three minutes, uh, please uh, close this. Okay. Okay. So maybe wait four minutes. Okay. Okay, I think uh, we can move on to the session now. Is the PowerPoint visible, Priya? Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay. So today uh, we are going to talk about um you already had a session uh, on weak opioids uh, uh, in the previous uh, week so we will be discussing mainly about um, step three opioids uh, except methadone we have a, a class exclusively on methadone uh, i think uh, last session <clears throat> and uh, what is the mechanism of action of opioids and uh, um, more commonly, uh, we will have many doubts uh, while we use uh, opioids. So that uh, also we will discuss. And what are the adverse effects, uh, which is uh, something which we need to know. Uh, it's a must know. Uh, and it is also important to know uh, what are the cost of uh, opioids. Because uh, many a times uh, patients comes, will come to you with uh, um, and in controlled uh, uncontrolled pain and uh, we may uh, increase the dose of opioids but we may not uh, explore beyond that sometimes it might be due to the patient uh, is unable to go for the work and uh, there is no money to buy opioids uh, so uh, we also uh, need to be very careful about the pharmacoeconomics of opioids okay so uh, this is the WH analgesic ladder, which uh, all of you are very familiar with. Um, you had a discussion uh, up to step two. Now we will move on to uh, step three, where uh, it is the step for opioids for moderate to severe pain. And it also includes uh, non-opioids as well as adjuncts. But we'll be uh, concentrating on opioids for moderate to severe pain. So all of you um, can see this patient uh, who is suffering from uh, carcinoma of the larynx. And if you see a patient like this, what uh, would be uh, your, uh, or uh, yeah, what, uh, what, is, what would be your first uh, reaction? Or is there anything that is going to stuck in your mind about this patient? What will you do first for this patient? Anybody can unmute and uh, speak. Anybody? Dr. Vivek says smoking history. Sorry, smoking. Okay. Anybody else? 
if you are seeing a patient like this in the casualty or in your clinic what would be your first concern uh his uh, uh, on the frontal region we can see that his eyebrows i mean there is the wrinkles on the forehead so probably he is experiencing pain okay <clears throat> yeah swami pranada also says pain he cannot talk so maybe we have to show a, a pictorial representation or something for him to express what uh, he is going through if it's a carcinoma of the larynx okay uh, so <clears throat> as uh, dr arpida and uh, my thoughts uh, sorry i i don't know whether i spelled it wrong uh, so yeah. um um it's uh, you can see the wrinkles in the forehead and the face uh, it is uh, it says us that the patient has a, or is in severe pain uh, so that's what uh, um, there are many other things which we can uh, look and see but uh, i think as a doctor medical doctor we should see his facial expression and the suffering on his face that's what uh, uh, that should be our primary concern he is suffering at the moment so uh, this is a patient with the <clears throat> carcinoma of the larynx <clears throat> and his main problem is um, pain around neck and uh, he says it is um, 10 by 10 or if there is uh, 11 or 12 uh, he would score uh, 11 or 12 <clears throat> and uh, the description is it's a sharp pain there is no radiation and he is unable to sleep for the last two weeks because of pain so uh, how will you manage this patient if this patient uh, comes to you anybody uh, uh sir uh, actually uh, as seen by the patient uh, so we can start uh, a strong opioid in this case because the patient have us uh, another uh, is a pain score 10 by 10 so we can directly go for the stabilizer double h stabilizer uh, in severe uh, uh, third step uh, third so we can go directly for the strong opioids okay thank you dr mohit uh, so this patient after an hour uh, he is smiling like this what is the magic behind this so this is yeah this is pain relief and uh, so fast isn't it uh, so this is because um, of intravenous morphine titration which we usually refer it as uh, intravenous morphine trial uh, it is a type of uh, rapid uh, titration of analgesics okay so how do you do intravenous morphine titration or trial so the uh, morphine ampule which is available in kerala is um, 1 ml which contains 15 mg of morphine okay and uh, we dilute it with 9 ml of normal saline so total 10 ml contains 15 mg so each ml contains 1.5 mg so we will give injection morphine 1.5 mg at 10 minutes interval okay uh, do you expect any side effects immediately after giving injection morphine anybody i am not quite sure but uh, some people may complain of uh, uh, a sensation like ants walking ants walking okay okay uh, vomiting yeah uh, i think uh, the immediate side effect that we can expect is uh, vomiting so we have to give uh, some antiemetic not some antiemetic it should be a uh antiemetic which acts on d2 receptor okay uh, so uh, it is uh, we usually give injection methoclopramide 10 mg iv followed by injection morphine 1.5 mg at 10 minutes interval and when would you stop injection morphine trial so end point is uh, either satisfactory pain relief or sleepiness whichever be the first so sometime patient may not have satisfactory pain relief the pa- but the patient develops uh, may develop drowsiness so you have to stop that's an indication to stop the morphine titration that's the importance of sleepiness okay and uh, uh, you can uh, also uh, uh, document this 
intravenous morphine trial uh, like this, which includes time, pulse rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, pain score. Is the patient drowsy or not? Because the one of the endpoint is drowsiness and the dose of injection morphine. So you can see that this patient is receiving morphine every 10 minutes interval. And uh, uh, first dose was given at 10 and uh, the uh, third dose um, at 1020, you can see the uh, pain score is uh, four. You will check the BP, pulse rate, respiratory rate, and you will uh, also look at the patient or ask the patient, are you drowsy? Patient says no, you will give uh, another 1.5. And uh, after, 10, uh, after 10 minutes, you will again assess the patient. Now the pain score is one. That means patient has satisfactory pain relief. So you can stop the trial. So uh, this patient received a total of 4.5 milligram of injection morphine. Okay. So uh, how will you convert uh, this? Uh, what is the, is this an inpatient procedure or outpatient procedure? Inpatient. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Arpita. Anybody else? Mohit? Sir, uh, if we give uh, morphine, so we have to be admit patient uh, first because we have to be see that, that drowsiness and all. Then we convert this uh, IV morphine to oral morphine. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, so uh, please understand that this is not an uh, inpatient procedure. This can be safely administered uh, in outpatient setting. And we usually do two or three morphine trials every day. And we immediately discharge the patient form. <clears throat> so this is an outpatient procedure. So this patient received 4.5 milligram of IV morphine. And he has very good pain relief. Now we have to send the patient so that we have to convert the IV morphine to oral morphine. Okay. So how will you convert? What is the conversion ratio? Sir, one raised to three. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, Dr. Mohit is uh, correct in a way. Uh, but uh, uh, what we have to understand is uh, when the patient is on uh, IV morphine continuously for at least 24 hours, that's the time uh, for the morphine to get the blood level stabilized. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then in such instances, you can convert into three. But in this patient, we have uh, given only uh, two or three times 1.5 milligram and uh, uh, it's only one uh, maybe some 40 minutes or 30 minutes so you cannot convert uh, in uh, with uh, the factor three uh, actually we can convert directly uh, the iv morphine which you have given can be converted uh, to the same dose of oral morphine so 4.5 milligram of IV morphine will be equivalent to 4.5 milligram of, sorry, 4.5 milligram IV, IV morphine is equivalent to 4.5 milligram of oral morphine. But from the practical point of view, uh, the strength of tablets available should also be looked into because we have uh, 10 milligram tablets. So you can break it into uh, two halves and you can administer 5 milligram. Okay. So this is what uh, you can do. Uh, Morphine has to be given every four hourly because the duration of action is about three to five hours. So every four hours, you should administer morphine. Uh, so tab morphine in this patient, we have to give tab morphine 10 milligram. Uh, you can say uh, 6 a.m. instead of wait, uh, when the patient wakes up and then 10 a.m., then 2 p.m., then 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. So you can see at 10 p.m., we administer the double dose of morphine. Here, uh, all the regular doses are half, whereas at bedtime, we give a uh, double dose. And uh, you can also add an SOS dose, S and when needed dose. Okay, so this is how morphine has to be administered <clears throat> every four hour live. So you know that the patients with pain will be uh, sleeping during the morning time. By 6 a.m., they would not wake up. So you can give the first dose when the patient wakes up. Likewise, uh, the 10 p.m. dose also can be altered. Instead of 10 p.m., if a patient says, I want to go to bed by 9 p.m., give it, uh, give the double dose at 9 p.m. and let him sleep. Okay, and if uh, um, injectable morphine is not available, oral morphine uh, can be given as trial. And uh, if the patient is opioid name, that is patient is not on any opioids, you can start with 5 milligram morphine, 4 hourly and SOS. 
if a patient comes with severe pain and if the patient is not on any opioids start with moral morphine 5 mg 4 hourly and SOS and if the patient is on weak opioid like tramadol or codeine uh, change it to 10 mg morphine every 4 hourly and SOS <coughs> So Sripriya, uh, now uh, we are having breakout rooms. Sripriya will divide you into four groups and each group will have about uh, 15 doctors. Uh, you will be given, um, each group will be given a separate question and you have to um, discuss it in the group and uh, uh, come up with the um, answers that your group has discussed. So please select a leader uh, once you are in the group and the leader will uh, present it to the main group and I think Sripriya we can have only uh, five minutes uh, or maximum six minutes for uh, this uh, breakout rooms. Okay sir, Sunil sir just confirming are we going with four or five breakout rooms? Oh okay five breakout five. rooms. So, okay. yeah. so here are the ground rules once we launch the breakout room each participant will get an intimation in the screen to join one room. And upon joining the room, we will be sharing a story. So uh, the story number will be the same room number. Once immediately after joining the room, please select a representative from your end who will be summarizing your discussions at the end. Once the breakout rooms are closed. I hope I am clear. Where can they see the question script here? Sir, we will be sharing it in chat and in WhatsApp group as well. Okay, thank you. Back. Okay, uh, we will uh, discuss uh, this patient stories now. So, uh, uh, so this was the first patient story, Mr. X. Uh, our patient uh, whom we have given intravenous morphine trial, he was started on 5 mg of morphine for hourly and SOS. He was relatively pain free for the last two weeks, but then he needed 4 SOS dose of morphine per day for the last 4 days. What shall we do now? Uh, and how frequently would uh, you give SOS dose of foreign morphine? Um, group number one, uh, can you? Uh, come up with your discussion. Sorry, Dr. Sunil. Actually, we, we haven't come, come we, we, we haven't actually come up with a conclusion. We are still discussing. But generally, the, the, the discussion is that uh, uh, personally, I, I would change the, uh, what they call, I, I would recalculate the uh, daily requirement and actually change it to a slow release morphine of 25 milligram two times a day as a uh, background uh, morphine and at the same time add an 8 milligram morphine uh, 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 immediate release morphine as uh, this uh, 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 SOS dose. Mm, okay. yeah. So actually uh, I, I do I do agree sometimes we would say uh, we would still give patient immediate release uh, for six times a day but personally I think six times as background morphine will be a bit uh, troublesome so I prefer to give uh, sustained release for two times a day, 25, 25, plus another eight milligram as SOS doses. Uh, okay, thank you, Dr. C. V. Uh, so uh, that's uh, one thing that can be done, uh, but the problem is that uh, sustained release morphine is um, about uh, four to five times more costlier than the immediate release morphine, and uh, <clears throat> uh, that's where the catch is. Uh, so, um, like a, a country in India, uh, where there are many people who are unable to afford anything, uh, so um, we may not be able to convert it into sustained release morphine. And this morphine is provided by many of the, uh, um, probably by the palliative care institution who provide it free of cost. So they will not be able to afford. That would be the main pro problem. But uh, okay. Uh, uh, so what you have done is uh, um, correct. Um, you have to calculate the dose of morphine and then um, uh, see how much morphine is uh, required for this patient daily. Uh, so in this, uh, so you can see this patient is receiving four SOS dose in addition to the regular dose. 
that means you have to increase the dose uh, that's uh, the answer is so what is the indication for uh, increasing the dose of morphine when the patient is taking two or more than two prn or sos dose prn is same as sos dose you can increase the dose of morphine by 30 to 50 percentage uh, maybe every 24 to 36 hours not two to three days you can increase every 24 to 36 hours because um, morphine will take only 24 hours to for the blood level to get stabilized so you can increase the dose by 30 to 50 percentage if the patient is taking two or more than uh, SOS doses, here the patient is taking um, four SOS doses. So definitely that's an indication for increasing the um, dose of morphine. Or uh, like uh, CV told, um, you can convert it into a sustained release morphine, uh, but that we will uh, talk about, uh, later. Uh, so what should be uh, uh, the increase? Uh, you can increase the... <clears throat> uh, uh, if you increase 30 percent uh, of 5 milligram that will be only 1.5 so 5 plus 1.5 6.5 milligram which is practically not feasible uh, so you can uh, have a 50 percentage increase so 50 percentage of 5 milligram is 2.5 so 5 plus 2.5 is 7.5 milligram so you can give 7.5 milligram every 10 hourly or even um, you can have an increase of uh, 100 percentage because some people find it very difficult to take uh, 7.5 milligram because you have to break the tablet into four pieces. Uh, so that's very difficult. So 7.5 to 10 milligram should be okay. And uh, how frequently uh, would you give SOS dose of foreign morphine? That was the second question. No answer on this, we didn't discuss about this. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so for this, uh, we have to know uh, some pharmacology, pharmacokinetics of the morphine. So what happens to morphine in the body? So uh, so this is uh, the uh, poppy plant or opium plant, uh, and it is known as papaver somniferum. And this is cultivated only uh, in three states in India legally. Okay. Uh, so these three states are UP, MP, and Rajasthan. Um, and you can see the farmers are making small cuts on the pod. The seed like thing is called pod, and uh, the sap is coming out. This sap is uh, collected uh, and it is dried in the sunlight. And this um, uh, this thing is uh, then transported into government opium and alkaloid factories, where they will make out morphine opium powder out of this. And from this uh, opium powder, uh, they make morphine. So this is what happens to morphine. Uh, and um, um, actually, morphine is absorbed from the uh, upper small intestine, uh, from the uh, duodenum mainly. And uh, morphine is um, hydrophilic. That is, it is water soluble. Uh, so because of this uh, water solubility, it has a slower onset of action. But uh, due to that itself, it has a longer duration of action it's, uh, as such. So it is hydrophilic. And uh, uh, some people advise uh, to give morphine sublingually, but uh, that's uh, not a very good uh, choice because absorption is very low. And uh, 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 some literature even advises uh, don't administer morphine sublingually. And if uh, somebody has pain relief after sublingual administration, that means probably the patient has swallowed uh, the morphine. That's why they have um, pain relief. And the buccal and the gingival root is also not advised. Uh, the important thing is that if you uh, powder the morphine tablet, it will have a bitter taste. So you have to see it when it is uh, some sugar or fruit juice. So once you swallow, uh, morphine goes into the GI tract uh, and it is absorbed into the blood vessels of intestine. Uh, from where it goes into the portal vein, uh, from there to liver, where the metabolism actually takes place. And this metabolites are liberated in the systemic circulation. So metabolism mainly takes place in liver, but minor part also in the and kidney. And 90% uh, of morphine will be converted into metabolites. And the main metabolites are morphine 3-glucuronide in short M3G and uh, M6G. And so you can see the M6G is formed only in small quantities, 5 to 10 percentage. 
and this is the active component which will give you a pain relief and 3g doesn't have much action in our body okay uh, so uh, dr shweta are you size x size sorry i cannot hear you properly your voice is breaking okay and um, please um, send your message in the chat uh, so once the morphine uh, swallowed it has to go uh, it has to be absorbed into the blood vessels uh, into the portal vein in the liver it, is, it gets metabolized then liberated into the uh, systemic circulation so for this process to occur uh, it will take about 30 to 40 minutes so um, pain relief will start by 30 minutes but the peak will be by 1 hour so the answer would be you can give oral morphine uh, SOS dose every hourly if you want. So this is the second question. Mr. X pain was well stabilized with 10 milligram four hourly, but he finds it difficult to take every four hourly. He says he is willing to take it if you give less frequently. What will you do? Group two. Uh, sir, we can go for the sustained relief morphine if patient can afford for the. Uh, that pain cost okay. or another yeah. another mm -hmm. one that uh, if sir we can uh, take another history patient that what kind of patient uh, patient have pain that uh, you know other uh, that uh, other than the somatic and uh, this uh, that uh, that neuropathic patient if patient have the neuro uh, neuropathic pain so we can add some adjuvant to this okay uh, thank you uh, dr mohit uh, so this patient's pain is stabilized with the 10 milligram. That means patient has good pain relief. So we need not uh, add anything else, but uh, what you have told uh, at first, uh, converting it into sustained release. Uh, uh, because the patient is uh, telling you, I cannot take it every four hourly, please give it less frequently. So you can convert it into sustained release. So uh, sustained release morphine has a duration of action of 12 hours. So you only need to give it twice a day. So uh, this patient is taking actually total uh, morphine of 60 milligram. You can see 10 milligram every four hours. So 60 milligram divided into two, that means 30 milligram. So tab morphine uh, sustained release 30 milligram BD can be given with an option for uh, breakthrough pain. Uh, you can use the same dose 10 milligram tab morphine 10 milligram immediate release morphine SOS. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so these are the preparations of morphine available for us. Uh, Aqueous solutions, uh, tablets. Tablets. There are two forms: immediate release and control release. Uh, Sometimes it will be capsules and injection. Uh, suppositories are not available. So this was the story three. Uh, the same patient who was on 10 milligram of morphine every four hourly for the past six months. He was brought to you uh, with excessive drowsiness. On examination, it was found that he has a serum creatinine of 5 milligrams per deciliter. Will you do anything with morphine dosage? Group 3. Sir, we planned, we discussed a shot and we were like this due to this metabolism and reaching a stable dose. Uh, we need to calculate the glomerular filtration rate and depending on that, we need to reduce and readjust the morphine dose and add any other adjuvant. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, so, uh, what you have to understand is um, um, morphine is, uh, so we talked about metabolism. Uh, it is liberated, the metabolites are liber liberated in the systemic circulation. But uh, it is excreted from the body through uh, glomerular filtration by the kidney. So what happens in renal failure, the clearance is decreased and the half-life is prolonged. Uh, so that M6G is going to accumulate uh, in the system. Morphine is not cleared out from the body. It is there in the system. So uh, what happens uh, if uh, there is more M6G and M3G in your system? Uh, you will be drowsy. So as you told, um, we have to reduce the dose of morphine. That's what uh, we can do. 
uh, so this is one situation where uh, you uh, will uh, give morphine um, less frequently that means uh, instead of four hourly you will give eight hourly or 12 hourly even or even uh, once daily depending on the serum creatinine and uh, um, uh, uh, estimated uh, gfr is uh, something which we can calculate from uh, serum creatinine and uh, with some other parameters also or you can also uh, give uh, renally safe opioids so uh, fentanyl and uh, methadone are the two opioids uh, which we can use uh, in india and those are comparatively safer in a renal failure so this is story for mr x was sent home and is now taking tab morphine 5 mg 8 hourly after two months he was unable to swallow anything including morphine what will you do now for pain relief group number four Uh, sir, we will change to intravenous morphine and also we can consider fentanyl transdermal patches. Okay, um, thank you. Um, um, but uh, this patient is at home. Uh, so, will you be able to give uh, injectable morphine uh, at home? Uh, transdermal fentanyl patch is another option. But uh, how much uh, transdermal fentanyl uh, would you give in this patient? So this patient is taking only 15 milligrams a day. So can we give morphine through any other route? OK, uh, so uh, we can look at uh, what are the routes of uh, uh, routes through which you can give morphine. So intravenous or subcutaneous. Mm, which uh, usually needs the help of a nurse. Uh, but if you teach the caregiver, then uh, subcutaneous morphine can be administered at home. And uh, oral, uh, that's the most common route. Uh, morphine can also be administered perrectally, epidural and uh, intrathecal. Uh, so in this patient, uh, you can actually administer morphine perrectally. Uh, so that, that is the cheapest option. Uh, so uh, actually oral uh, parectal route is comparable to oral route. So if you give 5 milligram 8 hourly, you can give 5 milligram uh, 8 hourly through parectal route. So I told you morphine is hydrophilic. So take the morph uh, immediate release um, morphine tablet, add two drops of water, make it a paste and uh, rub it over the rectal mucosa it will have the same results as uh, that of uh, oral morphine. <clears throat> so that's the uh, option you can give, but uh, injectable morphine can be given, but it needs professional help. And in this patient, uh, transdermal fentanyl patch is not an option because uh, he's only receiving 15 milligram of morphine. Uh, so which is uh, very, very low dose to start uh, with the fentanyl. So Mr. X <clears throat> was sent home and is now taking tab morphine 5 milligram 8 hourly after two months. Okay, so which we have discussed. So 5 milligram per rectal 8 hourly. Uh, you have to use fast acting tablet. So this was the story file. Mr. Mrs. K, 55 year old lady with carcinoma of the colon has abdominal pain, continuous on 10 milligram morphine 4 hourly and she doesn't require any SOS source of morphine. A doctor has asked them to replace morphine with the 25 microgram fentanyl patch. Next day, patient reports to you telling that they replaced the fentanyl patch after five hours as she had no pain relief. What will you do now? Group five. Group five. Anybody from group five? Uh, oh, sir, I, actually, we were uh, we were really confused about the question. Wasn't clear whether uh, she, she was having pain. Des the continuous pain was despite the morphine, but whether she doesn't. It says she doesn't require any SOS dose, and mm. uh, why it was changed from twenty five microgram. I think twenty five at uh, the last class. Uh, sir said twenty five microgram equals to thirty mg of 
morphine uh, so it's like uh, very unclear okay okay uh, so this patient uh, has uh, uh, 55 old lady with the same amount of colon has abdominal pain continuous on 10 mg morphine for hourly oh, okay uh, yeah it was a bit, uh, bit unclear um yeah but still uh, what will you do uh, or what is the actually that is not the um, crux of this question um the important point is something else anybody else uh, want to uh, comment on this what will you do in this patient so uh, mm. use an adjuvant uh, drug uh, like uh, add uh, add an oral dose of morphine uh, plus the fentanyl patch or add an, add an adjuvant drug uh, okay like suppose this patient okay suppose this patient had a good pain relief with 10 mg of morphine for a day and the uh, doctor converted uh, this uh, to fentanyl patch that's why he's on 25 microgram so what would be your answer now patient has good pain relief with 10 mg for hourly morphine and uh, she doesn't require <coughs> any uh, SOS dose of morphine you can restart morphine sir can we go back to Sorry. now why the patient uh, uh, then had pain relief <coughs> uh Maybe because the patch is not placed properly, because they have taken it out after five hours. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, so, transdermal fentanyl patch. A few things uh, you have to be careful about uh, fentanyl patches. Uh, it's mechanism of action. Uh, why, when you apply a fentanyl patch, uh, what happens is it form, first forms a subcutaneous tissue depot or subcutaneous tissue storage. And from this storage, the fentanyl is liberated every hour. Day. Yeah, suppose uh, if you place 25 microgram patch, that means it will liberate 25 microgram of fentanyl every hour. Day. That's what uh, the strength of fentanyl patch indicates. 50 microgram patch means 50 microgram will be liberated every hour. Day. So uh, it forms a subcutaneous tissue depot. Uh, but for this subcutaneous tissue depot to occur, it will take about 8 to 12 hours and even more. So uh, this patient um, actually replaced the patch after five hours. Uh, so probably uh, the, there was no subcutaneous tissue depot uh, that uh, can re be released into the systemic circulation for pain relief. That's why the patient didn't have pain relief. So it is our duty to explain to the patient properly what to do, uh, when, will you ex when are you expecting pain relief, and uh, till that time, what will you do? So you have to continue the morphine or opioids which the patient was taking previously till 8 to 12 hours. So this is a very practical problem because we are seeing many patients in our OPD who comes and says uh, this type of uh, things. So this happens very frequently. So please explain to the patient that we, it will take about 8 to 12 hours to get pain relief and continue to use the same opioid. In this patient, continue to use morphine 10 milligram till eight to eight to 12 hours. So the pain relief lasts for uh, 72 hours. That means three days. So you need to replace the patch only after uh, three days. And uh, while you apply the patch, uh, you should not shave the area because that will increase the absorption. And uh, the patient's uh, body temperature also affects absorption. So fever or if the patient uh, goes, uh, and uh, cook, uh, then uh, the uh, heat will also increase the absorption. So those are few things which you have to be careful. And uh, don't use it for patients who has unstable pain. So only if those patients whose pain is stabilized with short-acting uh, opioids, then you convert it into long-acting uh, opioids like transdermal and antibiotics. So three types of preparations are available. Injection, transdermal fentanyl patch, and oral transmucosal fentanyl citrate. It is like a lollipop. 
and uh, phenylalanine is 100 to 150 times more potent than morphine and for practical purpose we take it as 100 times more potent than morphine so 60 milligram of oral morphine equivalent per day will be equivalent to 25 microgram per hour fentanyl patch okay so 60 milligram in 24 hours of morphine is equal to 25 microgram of fentanyl patch so this is how you can uh, calculate if it is 120 milligram of oral morphine it will be equivalent to 50 microgram of fentanyl patch so next uh, we will move on to another question uh, so Mr. P, 70-year-old man, has custom of the lung and is complaining of throbbing pain on right front of chest, continuous, 5 by 10. He is a non-epileptic and is on phenytoin, 100 milligram bed. How will you manage his pain? Anybody? Uh, fast. Please unmute and speak. Dr. Benna says fentanyl patch. Dr. Nisham also says patch. Dr. Gibbons says uh, Which weak opioid? Dr. Gibbon, you are muted. Dr. G. B. John, you are muted. Dr. Jennifer says weak opioid. Okay, uh, here the patient has a pain score of 5 by 10. That means patient has um, moderate pain. 0 to 3, we can say it's uh, mild pain. Uh, 4 to 6, uh, moderate pain. And uh, 7 and uh, beyond, it's severe pain. So according to WHO ladder, uh, what step uh, should be used here? Which step? It is step 2, isn't it? So in the step 2, we have opioids for mild to moderate pain. Uh, so, which are the opioids in that step? Anybody? Tramadol and Tepentadol. Responses are coming in as Tramadol. Dr. Nishan says good. Dr. Nishan says Tependadol. Tramadol is the main response coming in. So. We can add Tependadol as a Tramadol uh, uh, have uh, that kind of the seizure uh, threshold to reduce the seizure threshold of the patient as history of the uh, previously epileptic. We can't add the Tramadol. Better to add Tependadol which have a better safety profile. Uh, I believe uh, we lost Sunil sir for a moment because of connectivity issue. Sunil sir. Sunil sir, do we have you back? I'm back. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Dr. Mohit, I believe, was saying something when you got this correct. Okay, uh, are you able to see this? Yes, sir. Screen is visible, not in uh, presentation mode. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Uh, so, um, I was talking about uh, step two uh, opioids, and uh, we have tramadol, dextrofloxacin, and uh, codeine, uh, tapenadol in step two. But uh, uh, the most common opioids used in step two is uh, tramadol. But tramadol also have a problem that uh, it will reduce the seizure threshold. So in this patient who is a non-epileptic, and uh, if you give tramadol, there is a chance that it can precipitate seizure. So uh, for this patient um, or patients who are prone to have uh, seizure, uh, like uh, patients with brain metastasis, or patients with uh, who are on tricyclic antidepressants, 
uh, those in those patients uh, probably uh, tramadol um, you have to be very careful uh, i haven't seen any patient developing seizure with uh, tramadol but it's there in uh, textbook and literature saying that there is a uh, tramadol has a seizure um, producing tendency or reduces the seizure threshold so maybe in this patient you can use even reduced dose of morphine maybe with uh, 2.5 milligram of morphine for our day okay so we will move on to the next question mr p is on tab morphine 50 milligram uh, mrs p uh, on tab morphine 50 milligram for hourly she attends your clinic with severe pain you have injection pendosocin and oral morphine tablets how will you manage anybody please unmute and uh, uh, comment on this you have injection pendosocin as well as oral morphine tablet you don't have injection morphine so how will you manage this patient anybody anybody please okay for this uh, we have to understand about uh, the receptors of opioids so opioid uh, a drug or medicine can be called as an opioid uh, if it has two properties one is its action should be produced by combining with opioid receptors and uh, the next one is its action should be antagonized by naloxone. So these are the two properties for a you know, uh, medicine to become opioid. And uh, you can see there are three types of opioid receptors, mu, kappa, and delta. And uh, these opioid receptors can be seen uh, throughout your body, but are more concentrated in uh, central nervous system. And uh, this is the classification based on the receptor interaction. You can see uh, it is divided into three agonist, antagonist, and agonist, and agonist. So, agonist means it is an opioid uh, which will combine with opioid receptors to produce physiological action. That means pain relief. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, other adverse effects also. Uh, agonist and agonist means these are opioids uh, which act on one uh, receptor as agonist, but on the other receptor as antagonist. And uh, antagonist means uh, uh, naloxone is an antagonist. If I give naloxone to you, it will not be, uh, it will not produce any action in your body unless you are on opioids. So if you take, uh, if you are on morphine and I give naloxone, its action will be reversed. But unless you are on, uh, suppose you are not taking any opioids and I give uh, antagonist like naloxone, it will not have any action in your body. So. The examples of agonists and agonists are buprenorphine and pendosocin. Pendosocin is a four twin, which we usually use in uh, operation theaters. Uh, so uh, this is the main difference between agonist and antagonist. Um, agonist and agonist. So you can see on the left hand side, um, the dose of uh, agonist, which, which is given, is on the x-axis. And uh, on the y-axis, it is the pain relief. So you can see uh, when the dose is increased correspondingly the pain relief is also increased and when you reach up to here you will get this much pain relief and when you give uh, this much dose that means you will get complete pain relief so as the dose of agonist opioid is increased you will get uh, complete pain relief theoretically but in case of agonist and agonist what happens after a dose a maximum dose the curve plateaus. So after you can see, this is the maximum dose which will give you the maximum pain relief up to here. But after that, even if you increase the dose, you will not have corresponding pain relief. That is the um, uh, problem with agonist and agonist. And this is known as seeding effect for analgesia. So agonist and agonist group of opioids have seeding effect for analgesia. That's what you have to understand. And uh, pendosocin, uh, it acts on two receptors. I told you it is an agonist and agonist. It acts on kappa receptors as agonist and as a weak antagonist at mu receptors. But morphine is a mu agonist. So what happens if you give um, uh, pendosocin to a patient who is already on morphine, what happens is the uh, morphine from the mu receptor will be replaced by the pendosocin. 
and pentacosin act mu is a weak antagonist so what happens instead of uh, we are expecting good pain relief but it will not happen it will actually aggravate the pain because pentacosin is uh, antagonist at mu receptor so in this patient we should not use um, more uh, pentacosin instead we should take the history and um, uh see uh, whether the patient has missed any dose of morphine and uh, either uh, give that missed dose or you can increase the dose uh, after taking the history so essentially uh, a pa when a patient is on a large dose of mu agonist like morphine don't give agonist and agonist like buprenorphine or pentacosin to patients so next is adverse effects of opiates it can be divided into two side effects and toxic effects what are side effects these are the adverse effects with therapeutic doses so the patient will have a good pain relief but at the same time there will be some adverse effects which are known as side effects so what are the side effects constipation nausea vomiting sleepiness and tiredness itching dry mouth urinary hesitancy the first three are the common side effects and the last three are the rare side effects the most important side effect is constipation which occurs in almost all the patients and uh, um, there are many mechanism by which it produces constipation so uh, a regular stimulant laxative should be prescribed for all patients who are uh, prescribed on opioids so uh, if you if you prescribe opioid you should also write a stimulant laxative you should not use uh, a, a laxatives like uh, methyl cellulose or um dispagula has etc it will actually aggravate the constipation so you have to continue the stimulant laxative as long as the patient is on uh, opioid next is nausea and vomiting and it occurs in about 33 percentage of patients but the importance is that it will be there only for the first three to five days so it's self-limiting and it is due to stimulation of chemoreceptor trigger zone in the brain and uh, the receptors uh, which are uh, abundant in CT set are uh, dopaminergic type 2 receptor and 5-HT3. And usually uh, dopaminergic type 2, that is D2 receptors antagonists should be used uh, to um, reduce the nausea and vomiting or to prevent nausea and vomiting. So haloperidol is the strongest D2 blocker followed by metoclopramide or domperidone. So we usually use metoclopramide. And sleepiness and tiredness is also self-limiting. It also occurs in patients, uh, maybe 30 percentage of patients, maybe for the first uh, few days. And uh, after that, uh, it will be over by itself. Next is toxic effect. What is toxic effect? It is the adverse effect when the administered dose is higher than the required dose for pain relief. So this will be manifested as delirium, myoclonus, drowsiness, pinpoint pupil, etc. So if the patient has delirium, myoclonus, drowsiness, that means the administered dose, the dose which you are giving is more than the required. So you have to reduce the dose of morphine. And this will be one of your concern, uh, which usually has in the professional community, opioids producing respiratory depression. So uh, we will look into the evidence which says, uh, this is a, um, a systematic review uh, from 2003 which says uh, usually opioids are given uh, orally so um, it is uh, it will only cause gradual increase in the blood level which ensures that respiratory depression is unusual okay and it also continues to say that when respiratory compromise does occur you should uh, seek an alternative explanation such as pneumonia, pulmonary embolism, cardiomyopathy, or co-administration of another sedating medication such as benzodiazepine. So I haven't seen any case of respiratory depression during the last 17 years of my uh, career in palliative care. I have prescribed morphine for uh, 10,000 of patients. So this is another uh, thing which um, causes problem for professional opioids causing addiction. So uh, there are uh, two types uh, of dependence. One is physical dependence and the other one is psychological dependence. So what is physical dependence? Uh, physic, uh, okay, sorry. So addiction is psychological dependence. 
so what is psychological dependence uh, the american pain medicine they says that it is a neurobiologic disease so addiction is seen as a disease in genetically predisposed individuals uh, when the environment becomes favorable the person may get addicted so in a genetically predisposed individual uh, when the environment and the psychosocial factors becomes favorable then the patient may get addicted and it may manifest as impaired control over drug use compulsive use and continued use despite harm and craving for the same so uh, physical dependence can occur uh, with many uh, medications like antihypertensives um Uh, or even tricyclic antidepressants that means when you uh, continue to take uh, a medicine uh, there will be a constant blood level in your body and when you suddenly stop your uh, body will react to it and that's known as physical dependence so that will manifest as um, um, maybe um, sometime um, nausea vomiting abdominal pain um at uh, Uh, tears and uh, uh, um, many there are many mani- manifestations, but the physical dependence is not same as uh, psychological dependence. Um, this can occur with many type of uh, medications, and even in case of opioids, if you use opioids uh, for one month, then you have to actually taper the dose and then only stop. Don't stop abruptly. Uh, so i will move on to the cost of medic uh, opioids you can see um, the cost um, the morphine if you use 5 mg per hourly uh, it will cost only 3 rupees 50 paise uh, but if you use fentanyl to get the same pain relief you have to use it on 12.5 microgram patch which will which will cost about 250 to 400 rupees and for the same pain relief you have to spend 24 rupees to 50 rupees per day so this is the comparison so pharmacoeconomics also important in the use of opioids so i am stopping with this uh, we can have some quick questions anybody uh, sir you have told uh, haloperidol uh, on metoclopramide and uh, domperidone as a drug of choice for uh, vomiting induced by morphine is there any role for ondansetron uh, yeah um uh, ondansetron can be used but uh, uh, the uh, choice of uh, antiemetic for opioid induced you no know, cell vomiting is um d2 receptor antagonist uh because uh, in the ct set uh, um, the uh, receptors which are abundant are d2 uh, that is dopaminergic type 2 and uh, 5 hp3 is also present uh, but it is seen that uh, da- dopaminergic type 2 receptors are uh, good uh, then 5 hp3 receptor antagonist like um, ondansetron or granisetron in addition uh, the 5 hp3 antagonist one of the side effect of ondansetron is constipation so in addition to opioids causing constipation uh, if you give ondansetron that will add on to constipation so it is better to give a d2 receptor antagonist thank you sir excuse me sir sir i had a question yes. uh, sir uh, we will be knowing that a patient is having physical dependence only if we are tapering the dose of morphine uh no uh, only if you uh, abruptly stop suppose the Would patient uh, was on mor- morphine for 2 uh, months and you suddenly <laughs> stop the morphine then the patient as in uh, can this can have... happen iatrogenically sorry to interrupt this can happen iatrogenically like if you are moving on to another drug uh i didn't uh, actually get which uh, drug as uh, give me an example sir, suppose the patient is on sir, morphine so yeah. the the example one of the case study you said that the patient was on morphine and then the transdermal patch was shifted so we mm. had not we had not put a bridge drug we had not put in morphine so uh, only if on on our end if we are not able to tell the patient properly 
or the patient does not understand the instruction properly, then only the physical dependence would be seen. Uh, okay, uh, uh, probably uh, if you um, uh, if you change the patient from one opioid to another opioid, uh, there is no chance to produce <coughs> uh, physical depend. Uh, sorry, withdrawal reaction because uh, you are uh, giving the patient an equivalent of oral morphine. Uh, so you are just changing from one opioid to another opioid. Morphine is a new receptor agonist. Whereas fentanyl is also a mu receptor, strong mu receptor agonist. So that will not produce any withdrawal reaction. Uh, but if you stop morphine suddenly and don't give anything else, any other opioids, that will produce withdrawal reaction. Okay, sir. So, yes, sir, we have a couple of questions coming up in the chat box. The first is from yeah. Dr. Subalakshmi, whether morphine can be given to Parkinson's patients? Yes, uh, uh, it can be given, but uh, in Parkinson's, um, you have to find out what is the cause of uh, uh, pain uh, because uh, the rigidity itself can be uh, a cause of pain. So, uh, morphine is not the drug of choice in such situation. But if you have uh, uh, optimized uh, the Parkinsonian treatment and see uh, you feel that the patient has having somatic pain, then probably uh, morphine can be given. But uh, uh, another thing uh, is that uh, when you start patients, uh, when you start uh, patients on opioids who are having non-cancer pain, um, that chance of dependence is uh, more. So be careful uh, while you start uh, patients uh, with uh, uh, non-cancer pain, starting on opioids. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Dr. Ashwati TV. How can we normally taper the dose of morphine? Uh, sir, uh, okay. about uh, So, so uh, let me explain this. <clears throat> so one third of the dose uh, can be reduced. Uh, every week um, and uh, that's how you have to reduce the dose reduce uh, suppose the patient is on a 30 milligram morphine reduce it to 20 milligram for uh, uh, one week and then to uh, 10 milligram and uh, maybe even to 5 milligram and then 2.5 milligram od uh, and uh, on uh, make it uh, 2.5 milligram alternate days and stop yeah, uh, somebody was talking about withdrawal reaction. Yes, sir. Uh, what if the patient, uh, we start a uh, patient on morphine because of severe pain, like for example, mm. uh, if you say uh, see a breast and after surgery, her need of morphine has reduced. Uh, so how can we... Uh, so... Yeah. Um, so... so uh, 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 the what are the chances of her withdrawal uh, dependence? Okay, uh, so uh, this can happen uh, not only in case of surgery, but those patients who are undergoing any uh, specific therapies like chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or surgery, uh, we might have put the patient on motion for last three or four months. And uh, we have to anticipate that this patient is undergoing radiotherapy and probably his pain uh, will be reduced. So uh, most probably this patient will uh, come up with the toxicities like uh, delirium, myoclonus, extreme drowsiness. Uh, so we have to actually anticipate and uh, reduce the dose by um, 30 percentage and see whether uh, that will solve the problem. That's how you have to reduce the dose of morphine. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next uh, query is from Dr. G.B. John. How do we calculate renal doses of morphine according to creatinine clearance? Okay, uh, I think uh, this uh, needs more explanation. I think uh, I can send you an article on that. Okay, sir, I will note it down. Uh, Dr. Jennifer John wants to know whether opioids can be given to neuromuscular disorder patients. Um, you can give uh, morphine uh, or uh, uh, strong opioids for patients with severe pain. But uh, please understand that in non-cancer pain, uh, you have to uh, be very careful uh, 
uh, you have to actually optimize the treatment first and then uh, also add non pharmacological therapies and uh, then uh, only you start uh, strong opioids and before starting on strong strong opioids for non cancer pain um, there is something called as opioid risk tool because uh, the dependence is more uh, for these patients so maybe this opioid risk tool can be uh, 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 can be used to assess the um, risk of uh, dependence that the patient is patient may develop and um, uh, every week uh, you have to actually monitor the patient and see whether this uh, morphine or the strong opioids is giving uh, benefit for the patient you have to actually weigh between the benefit and risk and uh, see whether which is more and then only you continue it on a uh, trial basis uh, don't uh, go on continuing with the strong opioids for non cancer pain um, you need to have a plan in your mind and uh, need to have a return plan actually in the patient Uh, okay, uh, I see there is uh, another question. There so are we have questions. a couple of more questions coming in. So I just wanted your confirmation whether we should continue with that or uh, we have a case presentation as well. Okay, I think uh, Supriya, can, can you please uh, save the chat questions so that sure, we sir. can give the answer. You can share it in the um, WhatsApp group. Sure, sir. I will I'll note down the questions, I'll share it with you and once I get your Clarifications, I will share the same to them. Yeah. It's only uh, already 6.23. So we can move with the case presentation now. Okay, oh, sir. Dr. Sunita Devi, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present. I'm Dr. Akwajum Sunita. Um, I did my MD in the radiation oncology. Right now, I'm not practicing. Uh, I, uh, this one, um, I'm today I'm going to present on pain management. Uh, I'm presenting a case of 61 years old man with a known case of carcinoma prostate with metastasis to bone. Next slide, please. Uh, patient presented with pain in the left hip for the last two years. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so coming to the history of present illness, uh, Mr. X was presently apparently all right till last week of December 2019, after which he had uh, dull aching pain in the left groin and the suprapubic area for around two days, followed by frank blood, passing of frank blood in urine. On the transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, he was diagnosed as moderately differentiated adenoma car, uh, of the prostate. Gleason score was 7, 4 plus 3. He was planned for surgery but he refused surgery and he went to EMS for further treatment. Next slide, please. At EMS, a uh, patient was started on ADT. Uh, in, the, uh, in the file, the, uh, the agents was not written and uh, he had some relief. He, according to him, he was telling that uh, he had some relief, uh, symptom relief after starting the medication. But in the early part of 2021, pain started again developing and it was increasing. On doing the PET scan on the 30th of March, 2021, new lesion was detected in the sacrum and the iliac bone. So the uh, doctor changed the regime to uh, pemorelin, which, which is tryptorelin, um, and uh, 25 milligram three, uh, three monthly, and then abiraterone to 50 milligram OD, dexamethasone 0.5 milligram BD, and jolitronic acid 4 milligram three monthly. And, uh, and it was continued uh, till October, but in October, again, his, uh, the pain started increasing and he had severe deep-seated pain in the left hip. And the score, according to him, was around uh, 9 out of 10. Um, 
in the numerical rating and the pain was stabbing in nature. It, it pain increased on movement and was more on lying down on the left side and stand, standing and was associated with weakness of the left leg. And PET scan was done and it showed new lesion in the left acetabulum. Medication for a pain was started and he was planned for a palliative RT uh, to the left hemipelvis, but he, he again refused the uh, radiation. Next slide, please. So on examination, uh, the patient was of average build, fair nutrition, BP was 130 by 90, uh, pulse rate was 86 beats per minute, SpO2 99%, and the all the systems were within normal limit. Uh, coming to the treatment and investigation, all the uh, routine investigation was within normal limit, but the PSA was raised, suggesting a, a progressive disease. PSA, PSA was uh, around 40. And at present, the patient is on liberolite, 11.25 uh, milligram, uh, three monthly, doxytexel, 140 milligram, three weekly, and tolutronic acid, uh, four milligram monthly. As uh, treatment was as per EMS protocol. Uh, pain management, um, for the management of pain, the patient is receiving morphine orally, uh, 20 milligram for hourly, then uh, the uh, gabapentin, uh, 300 milligram, uh, thrice a day, perastamol 500 milligram four times a day, and iterococcyp 90 milligram twice a day. Next slide, please. Uh, so the um, discussion point is that how do we adequately control the pain uh, in the um, uh, as the patient refused palliative RT, we have to continue with the uh, oral medicine only. So how to adequ uh, adequately control the pain is the main issue. And coming to the psychosocial aspect, uh, this uh, the patient is a cultivator and his economic condition is not sound. And he has uh, four daughters and two sons out of his daughters. Uh, two of his daughters were earning and they were uh, bearing the expenditure of the treatment. He is finally exhausted and he wished to carry on the treatment in dreams with the health scheme that is the uh, PMJ scheme. And he, he believes in God and he is emotionally stable. So the main concern is the pain and his financial problem. Thank you so much. Slide is over, I think. So coming to the summary, uh, that patient is a 61 years old male with a gastric resistant metastatic prostate cancer. Thank you all. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Sunita. Uh, so we have a 61 year old uh, man with uh, castrate resistant uh, um, say prostate uh, who has um, skeletal metastasis complaining of pain on the left hip region. Uh, he is receiving morphine, gabapentin, um, atoricoxib and paracetamol. Uh, so um, uh, how is his uh, pain with this regime? Uh, sir, right now the patient uh, is slightly relieved of the pain. The score has gone down a bit, but uh, pain is still there, around uh, 7 by 10. But uh, on lying down on the right side, pain is a bit relieved. But on standing up and on lying on the left side, uh, he, he experienced that pain, that excruciating pain. Okay. Uh, so any of you want to uh, comment on the pain management? Anybody? I know that some of you are working in palliative care. Should we titrate the morphine dosage, oral morphine? Okay. Mm, yeah. That's a good answer. Anybody? 
everybody else uh, we could also try and uh, know so as to why is he refusing to the palliative treatment what are his concerns what are his fears and anxiety yeah that's very important uh, because the patient uh, refused radiotherapy uh, mm. so we have to find out why he is uh, he refused the palliative art so dr sunitha any uh, do you have any information on that either sir the patient is scared of art most probably sir and he is uh, uh, telling that he doesn't want any radiation so but patient is somehow convinced and uh, they may be starting radiation soon but till now to he hasn't received mm. okay so this is something which uh, uh, we need to explore uh, because the patient might have seen somebody else uh, who has uh, died uh, uh, immediately after rt and patient might be thinking that it is because of rt not because of uh, the disease progression so there are many problems the pa patient uh, might think uh, of uh, about uh, rt and there are many misconceptions regarding radiotherapy Uh, so uh, we don't know what is the cause uh, with which he refused palliative radiotherapy so it is important as uh, for to explore and find out the reason uh, because uh, pain is not only the physical sensation it's the uh, total um, suffering it includes the physical problems the psychological problems uh, the social and financial problems and spiritual problems so uh, so when you assess pain we have to look into all these aspects so we have to actually explore more into his uh, other uh, problems um, and uh, he uh, he's worried about his financial status uh, as from your um, uh, presentation uh, so we have to actually um, uh, uh, explore uh, about uh, what is his financial status and what are the types of help that uh, can be given to him all those are very important once he get some assurance that uh, okay this your treatment will be covered under the pmj by or something then probably uh, that uh, will take care of uh, some aspect of pain but definitely he has physical pain which we have to address uh, so increasing the dose of morphine if the patient doesn't have toxic effects like delirium myoclonus extreme drowsiness if no, there are not no, uh, these symptoms yeah no, then we can actually increase the dose of morphine and uh, from the description i see that uh, the pain is localized and uh, mm, yes sir it's localized uh, and it is more of incident pain that is pain on movement uh, yes, and uh, one uh, one thing uh, you need to understand is the incident pain is very difficult to control uh, because uh, incident pain is something which comes only on movement and it relieves uh, immediately after the movement uh, once the patient rests the uh, pain will be reduced so what happens is if you give uh, an opioid like morphine uh, very frequently for uh, incident pain the dose uh, which he is going to take uh, will be more than that is uh, required for pain relief and that will produce more drowsiness so uh, radiotherapy palliative radiotherapy to the uh, lactic lesion will be the most important thing here and uh, probably the bisphosphonates uh, which you are giving soldronic acid mm -hmm. uh, will also help him to some extent so but uh, increasing the dose of morphine is uh, something which uh, we can immediately Um, that immediately can be done and he is already on uh, nsaids uh, and uh, he is also getting dexamethasone as a part of uh, his treatment regime yes so mm -hmm. he is on nsaid steroids um, then um, gabapentin morphin and paracetamol mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. yeah and dr paul dibagar has said increasing the dose of morphine and encouraging for rt uh, counseling yeah sir so one thing yeah uh, we, can, uh, we actually can teach the patient about pain free uh, intervals like give morphine after 45 minutes for the uh, the time from the next 
uh, 40, one, one hour from the next 45 minutes we can use for uh, movement uh, the things daily activities that needs movement like cleaning going to bathroom taking bath and yeah. all those things can be done on the interval so that he be more pain will be more controlled yeah yeah that's an option yeah that's an option uh, so there are two uh, types of um, um, or uh, you can say um, actually these all are included under breakthrough pain one is uh, uh, volitional breakthrough pain and non volitional breakthrough pain volitional means uh, it comes on uh, it come it is under our control like uh, in movement or something like that but there is something called non volitional breakthrough pain uh, suppose you sneeze uh, cough which are not under your control that can also produce breakthrough pain uh, so um, um so we don't know uh, to plan uh, like uh, before cough uh, um, of 45 minutes before cough or sneezing we cannot plan like that but what you have told is uh, very uh, right um, after, uh, ask the patient to do daily activities after taking uh, morphine uh, about an hour after uh, that uh, the patient will have uh, some pain control so planned activities that's an important uh, aspect anybody else if after uh, increasing the dose of morphine uh, uh, and uh, if this patient uh, develops uh, toxic effects uh, then i would uh, convert this patient to methadone uh, which will uh, which will give him pain relief we will be talking about methadone in another class So what is the difference? What is the advantage of using methadone or fentanyl over the morphine? Okay, uh, so I will just uh, briefly explain uh, about methadone. So morphine is a mu receptor agonist, but methadone has many mechanisms of action. It acts on all opioid receptors as agonist, mu kappa delta, and uh, it also acts like a tricyclic antidepressant. That is, it inhibits the reuptake of noradrenaline and serotonin. Um, and methadone is also an NMDA antagonist, so it acts like ketamine. So these are three properties with which uh, methadone uh, is used to treat uh, refractory pain. Uh, and usually, um, the patients will have good pain relief with methadone. Anybody else? Any other quick uh, discussion points we can take in before you wind up for the day? In children, also uh, that does um, the uh, choice is uh, morphine. Uh, in children usually the step two uh, if you look at the pain management in children the step two of WHO ladder is not used uh, instead uh, we use uh, low dose morphine so oral dose of uh, morphine uh, is uh, 0.2 to 0.5 milligram uh, per kilogram uh, body weight for children every four hour day Point zero to point zero five. Okay. What are the points we must tell to patient before starting morphine? I, I, yeah. Now, most importantly, uh, talk about constipation, uh, which uh, will develop because uh, most of the patients will not take the laxatives uh, which you have written. So it is important to tell them that uh, you have to take uh, uh, laxatives uh, because uh, that is going to uh, morphine will. Uh, or opioids is going to cause constipation so in order to prevent that uh, we are using uh, laxatives uh, then um, for nausea and vomiting you are giving uh, um, 
metaclopramide which can be stopped after three to five days uh, and also talk about uh, the um, if the dose uh, you are taking is more then uh, you may develop uh, delirium myoclonus or drowsiness if that occurs please stop the uh, opioid and inform us so that we can adjust the dose so these are few things which you have to and also importantly uh, tell them uh, to keep the morphine uh, very safely uh, away from the children and uh, don't give morphine to somebody else who has been um, uh, in the neighborhood or in the um, family because there is a tendency to give morphine uh, or to use morphine. Uh, yeah, more methadone is, um, is, is the use of methadone limited in India. Uh, methadone is a new medication which has been introduced into Indian market only in 2018 for pain relief. But methadone was uh, used for um, uh, oral substitution therapy uh, for psychological dependence even before that. But uh, for pain relief, it came, uh, it uh, started using only in 2018. So. Uh, most of the Indian doctors don't know how to use methadone for pain relief. And that's the reason why methadone is not used by many of the um, palliative care institutions. Is there, um... is there anything else? Uh, sir, we had like you had asked me to remind about the discussion of poll questions. So okay, okay, yeah. Uh, do we want to discuss the answers for the poll questions? It may take uh, two three minutes. Okay. Uh, can you uh, show me uh, the questions quickly? Can you share it? Yes. Sir. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm seeing many yes. So you want to share the results, right? Uh, and yeah. Um, okay. So uh, this uh, first question: Morphine is used to treat moderate to severe pain. So that is uh, correct, isn't it? That's right then morphine usually causes psychological dependence. That's false. It doesn't usually cause psychological dependence. It rarely causes psychological dependence. Morphine usually causes a physical dependence. Yeah, that's uh, right. Because uh, if you use morphine uh, uh, for um, maybe at least for one month, mm -hmm. then if you don't taper, then it will cause uh, withdrawal reaction. So the answer is true. Morphine usually causes physical dependence. Maximum dose of morphine per day, there is no maximum dose because the dose required for the patient is the maximum dose for that patient. I have seen patients taking 2.5 milligram uh, once daily. So uh, I have even prescribed a patient with 450 milligram of morphine for our day. So there is no maximum dose for morphine. The duration of action of immediate release morphine is four hours. That's right. Most common side effect of opioid is constipation. Okay. So constipation is the most common side effect. Opioids causes renal failure. No, no. opioids doesn't cause renal failure, uh, but NSAIDs cause renal failure. Opioids um, like morphine, uh, it is excreted through renal root uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, it is um, in, in renal failure. The morphine gets accumulated in the body, and it can cause uh, toxic effects. But it will not cause uh, uh, renal injury or something like an NSAID. So this is the second poll. The dose of morphine should be reduced in patients with renal failure. That's true. Um, Fentanyl, uh, how to calculate? Uh, I think I will share a document. Fentanyl is comparatively safer in renal failure. That's also true. Fentanyl and methadone are the two strong opiates which are comparatively safer in renal failure. 
uh, phenyl is 100 times less potent than morphine that's wrong it is 100 times more potent than morphine phenyl transdermal patch is suitable for a patient who is in acute and unstable pain now it's false you should start phenyl transdermal patch only uh, for patients who has a stabilized pain and uh, uh, it should not be used in patients with acute pain because as you know it will take about 8 to 12 hours to uh, give uh, analgesia and uh, uh, it can only deliver constant amount of uh, uh, fentanyl we cannot alter the amount sealing effect for analgesia is shown by following opioids buprenorphine and pendazosin yeah uh, so we talked about agonist the difference between agonist and agonist and agonist so buprenorphine and pendazosin are agonist and agonist who has sealing effect for analgesia so you can increase the dose only up to a certain point and uh, then it will give pain relief up to that point but further increase will not cause uh, corresponding pain relief so it has sealing effect for analgesia the drug of choice for opioid induced constipation is i already talked about it it is stimulant laxative like bisacodyl uh, sodium bicosulfate or senna Uh, so that's all about the answers. Sri Priya? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you so much for joining uh, for today's session, sir. I think we already consumed 20 precious minutes from your busy schedule. We are running much ahead of the time now. So uh, thank you so much, Sunil, sir, for your valuable time. I believe uh, this was a wonderful session for all the participants out there. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's session. We have shared the uh, feedback link in the chat box and in the WhatsApp group as well. So please do provide your feedback before leaving. And uh, this is Sripriya signing off from the Tips Echo. See you in the next session. Till then, everyone, take care. Bye-bye.